Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session from the different parts of the world that you are joining from. Um, as you'll see from the title of this session, it's looking at innovation in responsible health systems and accounting for the many different voices that are involved. We have a really exciting lineup of speakers for you in this session today. Um, and over the rest of this session, I'll be together with my co-moderator introducing you to each of these speakers properly. Um, perhaps though, just to mention first that this session is moderated by members of the Ethics Thematic Working Group who were asked to help in coordinating this, this session and the presentations that you, will, um, that you will get to hear. So on to the next slide, please. So um, I'm Sassi Molyneux and I'm a co-chair with Dr. Dorcas Kamuya of the Ethics Thematic Working Group at Health Systems Global. Um, I'm uh, employed by University of Oxford and based in Oxford, but also have a my heart and a lot of my experience and uh, history based in Kenya. I'm a human geographer um, um, and did a PhD in behavioral studies and my main areas of interest are in empirical ethics and health policy and systems research. So joining us, um, next slide please, to um, help with the moderation of this session will be Hayley McGregor, who's also on the leadership of the Ethics Thematic Working Group. And Haley is working in the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex and is the lead of the Health and Nutrition Cluster. Um, Haley has a medical background and uh, is a clinical medical anthropologist um, with a strong expertise and interest also in health policy and systems research. Next slide, please. So we're very pleased to be having these five speakers with us today. Um, I think what we'll do rather than introducing each one of them in turn now is as we go through each of their presentations, we, or um, especially Haley, if she's managed to join us um, by then, will actually introduce each of these speakers in turn. So just before their presentations. The titles of everybody's presentations are listed on this slide. Um, and you'll see that two of these presentations have ethics in the title, um, which is one of the reasons um, that we've been asked as the Ethics Thematic Working Group to um, help to moderate this session. But all of these sessions touch in everyday ethics in different ways. So looking together at innovation, at different people's voices, uh, incorporating different perspectives, including at the front line into health system innovations. Next slide, please. Um, so I think it's in that um, gathering different voices, working at the front line in the everyday realities of health systems. That's why that is why we've been asked as the Ethics Thematic Working Group to moderate this session. Our interest as a thematic working group is making sure that ethics is not thought of as something that's done by philosophers only in um, meeting rooms, but that is something that all of us in health policy and systems research think about and embed into our daily practice. Um, and so I think we can be looking out for that, um, our responsibilities, the ethics elements, of our work in all of the presentations, but we won't be trying to pull a particular ethics lens across all of these different presentations. But just to mention that if you do want to hear more and engage more with the Ethics Thematic Working Group, we have an organized session in February on the 10th at 1 p.m. Dubai time. And you'll be able to hear a little bit more about our interest in everyday ethics in health policy and systems research particularly from a justice perspective, which is an area that's been relatively neglected, um, and including incorporating um, the increasingly prominent but long important um, issues around decolonization. So next slide, please. Um, the way that this session today will work is that we've already um, done much of the introduction. We're then gonna go on to each um, speaker's presentations 
one by one. Um, the fifth of the presentations by Dr. Diallo is in French. Um, and we're very lucky that we have managed to get a translation of that presentation, which will be available as a handout for you to read if you're not a French speaker at the same time that that presentation is being shown. Um, the rest of the presentations will be in English. We'll go through each of the presentations in turn. Please do use your um, chat boxes. I'll tell you exactly how to do that shortly. Um, to ask questions, to make comments, um, to contribute as each of the speakers is going along. It might be a question that you have for that particular speaker, or it might be something that you've thought about that's more general or that applies to another speaker. Please do feel free to, chat, to chip in those comments. Um, and then we'll have a question and answer session that will go on for 30 minutes after all of those um, after all of those speakers have talked and we'll be drawing on those questions that you've um, typed up in that question and answer session. Um, and then we'll wrap up with a final comments for the speakers. So thank you, next slide. Um, I'm not sure I'm a particularly well qualified person to give tips on using this platform. Um, but if you look through this slide, if you need to um, get any actual technical support, in terms of listening or contributing to text. Uh, we won't be able to hear your voices, but you can tap on that live support button on the right hand side there. Um, as I've mentioned, it would be great to hear any questions that you have for the speakers. Please use that live Q&A session uh, on the air platform to the right hand side, that red box halfway down on the right hand side in order to type in your question or your comment. Um, we're told that for the best user experience, you should have your sessions viewed in full screen. All of these sessions are going to be uh, available to be viewed from the next day and will remain available for 14 days. And another suggestion is that you adjust your br browser to 67% to play the session in full screen um, and that that also assists. So I think those are the main technical points on uh, using the platform. Next slide, please. Um, Hayley has now joined us. So I'm gonna hand over to Hayley to introduce our first speaker. Um, as I just planned, as I plan to do that, um, was David able to join us live? I know we have his presentation, but is he, was he available to join us live? Um, Meanwhile, I hand over to Haley. Welcome, Haley. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who's David Masoke, and we'll hear the recording of, of his talk. He's a lecturer at Makerere University School of Public Health in Uganda, and he's actually the co-chair of another thematic working group, the Community Health Workers Group, and that, and that will come through also in his presentation, which will look at the community health worker perspectives of ethical practice um, using photo voice in Uganda. He's a, a qualitative and um, quantitative researcher and a background in environmental health, primary health care and public health. And he also has this methodological interest. So if we could have David's recording. Thank you. My name is David Musoke, uh, and I'm here to share with you our findings from our research uh, on community health workers in Uganda using photo voice, whereby we explored their perspectives on ethical practice during the course of their work in Uganda. So the aim of this study uh, was to use photo voice, which is an innovative community-based participatory method to examine community health workers' perspectives concerning ethical concerns in their work uh, and just, for a, just as a brief background, photo voice is a methodology that uses photography as the main uh, tool to collect data, which photographs are later on used to elicit discussion. And that discussion normally um, forms the basis of the data that is used uh, uh, for the data as part of the study that is of concern. 
the methods briefly of our study, uh, this study was carried out in Wakiso district uh, in the central region of Uganda and involved uh, 10 community health workers, five males and five females. Uh, and it was carried out over a period of five months. And in these five months, we were able to train the CHWs on ethical practice and uh, as well as on use of uh, photo voice for research. And thereafter, I gave them cameras to take photographs over that period of time uh, to capture scenarios that concern ethical practice during the course of their work as community health workers. And those photographs were discussed in five monthly meetings, uh, which involved both the CHWs and uh, the researchers. And um, those discussions were audio recorded in the local language, later on uh, transcribed verbatim, and then translated to English for analysis, which analysis was done in Atlas TI uh, using conventional content analysis. The results of the study are as follows. Um, it was evident that uh, uh, from the study, the CHWs were aware of ethical principles uh, that they needed to observe during the course of their work, including issues such as maintaining professional integrity, which related to things such as uh, CHWs being able to refer to guidelines they had, uh, being able to wear uh, appropriate personal prote prote protective, e protective equipment while doing their work, uh, but also other um, practices in that line. But also they were able to note that they needed to observe ethical responsibility as they did their work, especially as they treated children um, who had either malaria, diarrhea, or pneumonia, which is one of their responsibilities as part of their work in rural Uganda. The CHWs also noted that they needed to maintain confidentiality, especially when they were handling patients and community members so as not to disclose any information to other members of the community. But also it emerged that they needed to observe uh, respect for communities, including respecting individuals, um, culture, background, and other aspects uh, while practicing their work in their communities. And lastly, uh, the results uh, also demonstrated that actually the CHWs should always enhance their knowledge and skills to be able to perform better during the course of their work in their communities. Then on the other hand, despite the CHWs being keen to observe ethical practice, it emerged that there are some challenges that they faced, which challenges uh, affect them in their pursuit to observe ethical uh, principles. So one of the challenges they noted was um, low commitment uh, to their work, given some of them were not full-time community health workers, uh, many of them were, mark, were working, especially the males, given that they are volunteers, which affected the time that they had to offer service in their communities. Then the other challenge they noticed was um, some materials they had to, uh, to refer to during their work was in English, yet many of them could uh, only read the local language, which was a major challenge during the course of their practice. And lastly, uh, it was also established that whereas they were keen to learn more about issues happening in, in health, opportunities for such trainings and workshops were minimal, which affected uh, the work that they did uh, concerning um, ethical principles. And last example to, 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 to demonstrate um, some of the issues emerging, top left is a photograph of SHW who was at a health center seeking health care, which uh, emphasized the need for them to be exemplary to seek health care when they were sick. Bottom left is a CHW who, was, um, who is holding a notebook, who was attending to a patient in a quiet private place, which emphasized the issue of confidentiality. And then uh, top right is a CHW who was wearing her gloves and referring to a book on the table while she drew blood from a child suspected of having malaria, which emphasized uh, professional integrity. And lastly, bottom right is a group of CHWs who are from a training which had enhanced their capacity and skills to perform better during the course of their work uh, in communities. So in conclusion, CHWs were keen to discuss and were aware of ethical issues concerning their work. However, a number of challenges uh, were, were noted, which challenges would need to be uh, addressed if they are to perform well and observe ethical principles during the course of their work. This research has been published and can be accessed uh, online 
and uh, the link uh, is available for those who wish to uh, get more about this particular uh, work. Lastly, I wish to acknowledge the funders and other people who played an instrumental role in this particular study, including the Research in Gender and Ethics or the Rings Consortium that was instrumental in um, the implementation of this work as well as the resulting publication. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to receive any feedback from you um, during the course of this presentation or at a later stage. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Heather Bullock, and today I'm presenting an examination of Could we have the slide for so that I can introduce Heather? So it's the next slide. Thank you. And then we'll play that um, recording. So um, our next speaker is, is Heather Bullock. And um, Heather um, has a background also in mental health and a PhD in health policy from um, McMaster University, but is currently working as director of provincial partnerships. Um, and these are um, works in health systems and, and indeed also in, in a practitioner context and with particular expertise in mental health and addiction, social determinants of those. And she's going to be um, giving us a presentation examining mental health implementation efforts and in particular the focus on the intermediaries that um, support these efforts. So if we could have um, Heather's recording now, please. Hello, my name is Heather Bullock and today I'm presenting an examination of mental health implementation efforts and the intermediaries that support them, a comparative case study. So why does this matter? Well, we've been having difficulty making headway toward reducing the burden of mental illness and addiction and improving mental health. And, and this is happening despite a better understanding of the problems that contribute to mental health and substance use concerns. It's happening despite better evidence regarding effective services and supports to prevent, intervene early, and treat people at risk of or experiencing mental health and substance use problems. And it's also happening despite increasing attention by policymakers across sectors. So why aren't we getting the changes based on the evidence and the attention and the understanding of the problems? Well, one reason I believe this uh, is happening is that we haven't been focused enough on the imp effective implementation of evidence-informed policies and practices. And this is what this study uh, explores. So the objective of this study is to explore how policy implementation is structured, the use of intermediaries, and the methods that support them in large, well-developed mental health systems. The goal is to explain whether and how features of the political system affect how implementation is structured and the strategies that are used. Uh, in terms of methods and design, we used a comparative case study. Uh, we selected intermediaries purposefully uh, in three jurisdictions, New Zealand, Ontario, Canada, and Sweden. Data were derived from semi-structured interviews, we did 54 of those, and publicly available documents. Uh, we examined 73 documents. We used a directed content analysis and drew from existing theory, including Kingdon, 3IE, and a mod modified interactive systems framework. We did this also in partnership with the International Initiative for Mental Health Leadership, using an integrated knowledge translation approach. So here's a graphic depiction of the implementation support infrastructure by case. Here you can see there's one main intermediary uh, playing this role in New Zealand, three in Ontario, Canada, and one main intermediary in Sweden. But it's important to note that even though I'm focused on those uh, on the left of the slide, that there is additional implementation infrastructure and clearly policy implementation takes the effort of many different organizations and many different individuals working together. This study had three questions. The first question was, why were the intermediaries established? The second, how are intermediaries structured and what strategies do they use in systems to support the implementation of policy directions? And finally, what explains the lack of use of particular strategies? So for question one, why were these intermediaries established? We first created timelines that led up to the establishment of each intermediary in terms of important uh, events 
uh, policy documents and activities that were happening in the, in the uh, environment. We used an explanatory analysis and Kingdon's multiple streams framework, and we found that in each jurisdiction, a unique set of problems, example, negative events involving people with mental illness, policies such as feedback on the effectiveness of existing policies, and finally, political events such as changes in the government were coupled by a policy entrepreneur to create intermediary capacity. And you can see there on the slide a couple of examples of the timelines. The second question I've divided into two parts. The first is how are intermediaries structured? And when looking at the structure and characteristics of intermediaries, we found many, many differences that you'll see listed there and very few similarities. And even with the similarities, they were quite often outliers. So you can't understand an intermediary based on just describing it alone. Uh, even though you know one when you see one, if you're looking at the structure and characteristics, it's not clear that they're the same thing when you look across different uh, jurisdictions. The second part of this question, what strategies do they use in systems to support the implementation of policy directions? Uh, we explored the implementation strategies that each of the intermediaries employed and the target system or target area of the policy environment that they uh, used for their implementation strategies. Um, and what you can see here is, uh, even though they're different in terms of their descriptive characteristics, when you look at the implementation strategies they use, they're very similar in terms of the strategies that they all use, as well as two strategies that they all did not use. So audit and provide feedback is one uh, strategy that none of these intermediaries employed. And the second is public awareness and education. So the final question, is uh, what explains the lack of use of audit and feedback and public awareness strategies. And uh, we did a 3IE analysis, so looking at the uh, institution's interests and ideas and any external events that may have affected um, their lack of use of particular strategies. And we found that there were five interest-related domains that uh, largely explained their lack of use of these strategies. So the first is that they had a need to build and maintain healthy relationships with the policy actors, and this specifically related to the public fo focus strategies. Their need to build and maintain healthy relationships with service delivery system actors, uh, and this related to the audit and feedback strategy. Their need to be different than other system actors, so role differentiation and this related to the public strategies. In other words, there were other organizations that were playing that role in systems. Fourth, they felt it was a lack of fit with the role of policy intermediaries, and that was for both of the strategies. And finally, resource limitations precluded intensive distributed program level work, such as the audit and feedback strategy. So that concludes my main findings. In terms of the implications, Policymakers and other actors seeking to implement evidence-informed policies and practices must consider the capacity needed to do it effectively. When looking to build implementation infrastructure, policymakers and implementers should make explicit choices in terms of design with appropriate consideration of political system context in addition to the health and social system context. Second, pay careful attention to the role of other actors in the system to ensure that the intermediary or intermediaries add value and are optimized to work with those actors effectively. Next, to make active decisions about the implementation strategies they intend to employ and monitor their use and effectiveness. And finally, build on the knowledge and experience about intermediaries that exist. There's no need to develop such infrastructure from scratch. So that concludes uh, a brief overview of, of our study today. I'd like to thank my three co-authors, Dr. John Lavis, Dr. Mike Wilson, and Dr. Jillian Mulville, and our Integrated Knowledge Translation Partner, the International Initiative for Mental Health Leadership. Thank you very much. So our next um, speaker is Pratap Kumar, who's a senior lecturer at Strathmore University Business School. And he's also a clinician um, a neuroscientist, but he's a health economist, um, and he works at the interface of health sciences and healthcare markets. And Pratap is going to talk to us about experiences from the senior executive program in global health 
innovation management, if we could have Pratap's recording. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Pratap Kumar from Strathmore University Business School in Nairobi, Kenya. My colleagues and I from both business schools and public health institutions all over the world would like to share our experiences in designing and developing a senior executive program in global health innovation management. First, I'd like to set the context for innovation education in global health. So the image you see is not only evocative of Costa Rica, one of the beautiful sites in this program, but also captures an important phrase in innovation, crossing the chasm, which talks about how many innovations fail to move from an idea to large scale adoption. Global health specifically needs a diverse set of people to know about innovation, for the whole field to see more ideas crossing the chasm. So first I'm gonna invite Till Bernighausen from Heidelberg to tell you more about this need. Till? Yeah, so there's a clear need, um, as we all know in this audience here, um, to address a number of rising and increasing um, global health challenges and the need um, for entrepreneurial activity and innovation and taking those innovations into um, better pop pop population health is our original motivation. I think COVID-19 has powerfully demonstrated and underlined how important it is and how local and global innovations can contribute to addressing um, healthcare needs um, very fast and um, at the same time with a need for strong management, strong ideation and concept and development. And um, that has motivated deeply our course. As part of the design process of the SEP gym, an online needs assessment was sent to professionals working in global health to assess their needs regarding skills on innovation and entrepreneurship and their training gaps to address this lack of expertise. For most of them, 98%, innovation is key for their organizations, but most innovators and business creators lack these innovation and entrepreneurial competencies. In our survey, respondents expressed their preference for face-to-face -face short courses in multiple locations rather than long trainings. While several general innovation or managerial education programs of similar design with different modules in different locations exist, none is focused in global health innovation management, offering us a clear niche to be addressed by the SEPGIM program. Next, in the mapping analysis we did of existing education programs, the majority of the 37 programs considered focus on global health innovation or global health management separately, specifically masters, MBAs and diplomas. However, the combination of global health innovation and management altogether is present in only four programs. Additionally, delivery models do not match with global health professionals' needs identified in the needs assessment. It's also worth mentioning that most programs available are in Europe and America, United States, a few in Asia and just two in Africa. And so far, only six are offered worldwide by distance learning mode with a minority, including blended format with face-to-face -face components. Within SEPGIM, we have gained better understanding of needs regarding innovation and entrepreneurship in the field of global health, as we have highlighted in this slide. Based on this, we developed SEPGIM with specific new contents, learning methodology and delivery model. And I pass to Magda to explain the details of the program. Thank you, Nuria. Yes, between these different partners, the public health schools and the business schools, we have designed uh, this curriculum in 2019 with four models. The, the first and the last model in, in, in Europe, starting with Heidelberg to see the global health challenges and the context, while in the fourth model, we looked into implementation, getting things done. In between, we had two mo models with an immersion in the local reality in Costa Rica and in Nairobi, and we will look into that in particular. And Andrea, tell us about Costa Rica. Well, in Costa Rica, they learn about the Latin American context in, in terms of the public health systems and the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Particularly, we focus on social entrepreneurship as a complement to government interventions to deliver health to vulnerable populations. We brought local innovators to share what are the challenges uh, to, to set up their organizations, and we we visited public clinics at the primary level of attention and joined healthcare leaders in the field. Thanks, Andrea. 
Uh, the session in Nairobi focused on introducing participants to digital innovation being used to transform health across East Africa. So we used a format of live cases, introducing participants to startups working on diverse areas, including service delivery, uh, service delivery innovations like Access Afia, health financing innovations like MTBA and Afia Poa, and those using cutting edge AI tools like Jacaranda Health in Kenya and Babylon Health in Rwanda. There were a number of themes that were presented and discussed, including the role of the startup ecosystem, like incubators, accelerators, IP lawyers, and investors. And one theme I'm particularly interested in is how local and global startups function in the same environment. So over to Nuria for some of the results. Yes, we will look at the executive challenge first that is like a red thread went through the whole program, which actually invited participants to bring their own personal or professional challenge to the table to benefit from the combined experience insights and networks of all. They were supported with one to one coaching to well focus their challenge so as to really benefit from this uh, uh, advice of their peers in a trusted environment, while those, the other participant also valued this very open sharing of uh, uh, the uh, uh, challenges that everyone is facing. Challenges, uh, example, were startup in Spain, quality strategy in a Colombian tertiary care hospital, an innovative redesign of a government malnutrition program in Central Asia, or a network to support women entrepreneurship in the Baltics. And now, Nodia, we go to the results. The first subject goal recruited 20 22 students with additional local participants. Students were for, from diverse geographies, had a minimum of 10 years of experience in academia, pharma, biotech, healthcare, NGOs, multilaterals, represented public, private and non-governmental sectors and startups. A final online survey revealed a very positive overall feedback. Participants highly rated the program 4.5 over 5, confirming that the course effectively covered their expectations. And as seen in the slide, the follow-up evaluation after one year revealed impressive results, such as the implementation of their executive challenges. I pass to Pratap for the final conclusions. Thanks, Nuria. So in conclusion, there are a number of aspects of the SEPTIM program that we could highlight, but I'd like to focus on three. The first is a combination of that local immersive learning with online content and support. That was something that developed before COVID, but it's something that we can continue using with small tweaks. Second is that there's a wide audience for understanding and participating in global health innovation. But this program also highlights that the need for diverse instruction and the partnership between leading public health institutions and business schools to deliver this instruction. And finally, SEPTIM is just one part of the wider effort to help innovations cross the chasm in global health. So innovation education needs to be delivered to different actors and by different actors for innovations to truly take hold. So I'd like to thank my colleagues, not just in this presentation, but everyone in the five institutions involved in SEPCHIM for making this unique program possible. And thanks to HSR 2020 for giving us the opportunity to share our experiences more widely. So thank you very much. Oh, great to hear that from the whole team. It was impressive. So our next speaker, if we could have the slide, is Anna Bocce, who's um, an academic leader um, for research in the School of Nursing and Public Health in the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. She's a health systems researcher of the um, South African health system and has contributed to key national, provincial and district health system strengthening innovations and Anna has a particular interest in leadership um, and leadership as a key contributor to health system performance and she's going to be sharing some um, insights from the Moyo Mukhle project um, in South Africa on health system strengthening if we could have Anna's recording. Colleagues thank you very much for this opportunity. The Umoyo Mutle project aimed to investigate the policy, systems and organization of care for TB infection prevention and control in primary care clinics in two provinces in South Africa. We present a cameo arising from this project to contribute to the body of work that recognizes that health systems are diverse, that health system strengthening interventions are embedded within this diversity 
and that in the health system strengthening endeavor, one size does not fit all. Challenges exist in conducting comparative and nuanced analyses of the health system of different countries. Thus, national health systems are broadly characterized by their strengths and weaknesses against composite performance indicators and health outcomes. Health system strengthening initiatives to improve national health system performance and program specific health outcomes can perpetuate a vertical and reductionist approach to health system strengthening without accounting for the diverse operational level microsystems. An analysis of compromised TBIPC implementation within a microsystem provides a lens through which to identify health system problems requiring whole system intervention. In this project, TBIPC implementation was analyzed within the microsystem of a primary healthcare facility in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. A case study approach was implemented adopting ethnographic methods with data generated through structured and unstructured observations, both formal interviews and informal conversations with diverse health facility staff and through the mapping of patient flows. Health systems are complex entities with the complexity reflected within the multiple microsystems constituting the whole. Analyzing health systems, even at the operational micro level, produces complex findings, messy situations, influenced by multiple interacting and dynamic components and forces. For the purposes of this presentation, the lens of the microsystem is placed on the main waiting area of the health facility. From a TB IPC perspective, the waiting area is a wicked problem to borrow the words of Jackson and Sambo, with people spending a long time in an overcrowded, poorly ventilated space, with the possibility of high TB transmission risk as a result of extended exposure to people with yet undiagnosed active TB disease, not mitigated by cough triaging, respiratory separation or respiratory hygiene. An analysis of the conditions in the main waiting area reveal that they are embedded in a national health system strengthening intervention, the integrated clinical services model of care. Specific to this situation, the model of care requires the facility to implement an appointment system to enable the pre-appointment retrieval of an integrated clinical record for each patient from a single administrative point so that on arrival to the clinic, the patient may proceed to the relevant stream of care. In practice, a clerk in the main waiting area issues each patient with the date for the next visit on a patient held appointment card. The facility has no record of whom to expect when and for what service, and can therefore not retrieve files pre-appointment requiring patients to queue for unacceptably long periods of time in the main waiting area to retrieve their clinical record. The system challenges underpinning the problems manifested in the main waiting area are diverse and comprise insufficient technical expertise for policy translation to the local context, both within the facility and at district level, a hierarchical organizational structure based on the issuing of directives requiring compliance, poor differentiation of management roles within and between system levels, poor team synergies fraught with tensions between professional categories, between managers and workers, between races, between staff and patients, and all this limiting adaptive learning capacity and innovation within this local context. Given the diversity of health system challenges, health system strengthening interventions require drawing on multiple system approaches. Functionalist approaches can assist to address issues of system design, function and role differentiation. 
An attractive approach is the Beers Viable Systems model, which highlights the need for responsiveness of the operational level to its environment, supported by coordination, control, development, and strategic functions. Soft system approaches can assist to address the interaction within and between levels of the system and between diverse stakeholders and interest groups. An attractive approach is ACOF's social system sciences and interactive planning approach, creating an effective decision-making environment, building adaptive learning capacities and team synergies. The approach is underpinned by principles of participation, constant revision and holism. Emancipatory approaches have a focus on changing the power relationships, adopting emergent models of leadership with the leader as host, enabling critical and creative contributions from the full potential available in the team. I'd like to quote from Jackson and Sambo, different system approaches can be used in combination to bring about improvement by addressing the multidimensional complexity thrown up by wicked problems. Nuanced health system strengthening approaches are needed to adapt interventions to the contours of the microsystems into which they are deployed. The embedded nature of health systems research challenges us as health system researchers. We need to develop the methods and tools for the implementation of nuanced, fit-for-purpose health system strengthening interventions implemented within spaces where researchers and implementers can learn from each other. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Anna, very much. So our final um, recording um, or speaker is to Alpha Amadou Diallo, who's um, from Guinea, the University of Conakry, where he's chair of public health. Um, and he also is involved in the National Ethics Committee of Guinea. And he um, has a background in behavioral studies and a research focus on health system policy and systems research and also ethics in research, which goes to the theme of our thematic working group. So Dr. Diallo's um, presentation is in French. For those of you who don't have French, if you go to the handout button in your interface, you can download a document that is an English translation of this presentation. And if you have questions for Dr. Diallo and can't um, write those in, in French, you can also pose them in English and we have um, a colleague who can translate those to give to him, so do go ahead. So if we can have Dr. Diallo's recording, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alpha Madu Diallo. I'm working at the Ministry of Health in Guinea Conakry. The theme that I'm going to develop concerning the environment of innovation, the questions of ethics and implications for the health of public in Guinea. Euh, je vais présenter des indicateurs de santé et de démographie avec la dynamique de renforcement des capacités du système de santé vers sa résilience. La population est de 12,6 millions d'habitants, les moins de 15 ans ont 44%, les femmes 52%. La fécondité est de 5,1 enfants pour une femme, la pauvreté est très élevée et le pays est en proie à des épidémies de rougeole, choléra, ébola, méningite, fièvre jaune, et des endémies comme le paludisme, la tuberculose et d'autres maladies. Nous avons procédé à l'intégration des services essentiels de santé, puis le renforcement des capacités d'intervention, et on a également apporté le processus de modélisation vers l'innovation pour la santé. Le pays, comme je le rappelais, a été frappé en 2013, en 2013 et 2016, par une épidémie de la maladie à virus Ebola qui a frappé la Guinée, la Sierra Leone et le Libéria. En, récemment, en 2019, nous avons été également, en 2020, confrontés à la pandémie de COVID-19 avec des bouleversements importants et des répercussions spectaculaires. Toutes ces épidémies ont démontré la fragilité du système de santé dans ses différentes composantes, avec un impact fort au plan social, au plan sanitaire, au plan économique et même au plan politique. 
En 2016, la politique de santé a été revisitée. Le système a été également analysé et les moyens de riposte contre les épidémies, d'une manière générale, ont été également questionnés. Il est apparu important de procéder à l'évaluation de l'environnement des innovations, les pratiques qui en découlent par rapport à la santé de la mère et de l'enfant, en lien avec l'éthique de la santé publique vers, le, vers la couverture sanitaire universelle. Nous avons procédé à la triangulation pour avoir pour des synthèses de messages clés avec des enseignements tirés pour orienter l'action et la politique de santé. L'analyse du système de santé de manière holistique après Ebola a conduit à des réformes. La première réforme, c'est de revisiter la politique de santé et élaborer le plan de développement sanitaire 2015-2024 avec une vision et des stratégies partagées entre l'ensemble des parties prenantes. L'adoption de la stratégie du financement de la santé vers la couverture sanitaire universelle à l'horizon 2030. Ça s'est fait en 2014. Nous avons également appliqué le règlement sanitaire international de l'OMS avec une dimension importante des questions éthiques à partir des leçons apprises d'Ebola en 2016. La promotion de la santé versus services de santé essentiels intégrés pour la santé de la mère et de l'enfant, notamment la stratégie de développement de la santé communautaire, la prise en charge intégrée des maladies de l'enfant et du nouveau-né, le programme santé de la reproduction et d'autres programmes. Puis, le renforcement de la prise en compte de l'éthique de la recherche, l'éthique des soins de santé et l'éthique des interventions en santé publique. Toutes ces orientations sont en lien avec les perspectives de l'innovation. L'environnement de l'innovation de la santé également concerne l'amélioration de la visibilité de la performance du système, notamment le cadre institutionnel, la création de l'Agence nationale de la sécurité sanitaire en 2016 et récemment le Conseil scientifique sur le COVID-19 qui relève de la primature. Au outil, on a organisé l'audit institutionnel et organisationnel plus fonctionnel du ministère de la Santé et on a procédé au au, à la restructuration du ministère en 2018, le PNS à l'horizon 2024, avec un focus sur le développement du district sanitaire. Nous avons également établi des contrats de performance avec les districts sanitaires et les hôpitaux. L'implémentation de la stratégie Une seule santé dans l'interface homme, animal et environnement. L'intégration des programmes verticaux au nombre de 18 pour arriver à 7. Il existe dans l'environnement un code d'éthique et un comité national d'éthique également est mis en place depuis, 2000, depuis 1998. Le comité national de biotique a, a été créé. La chaire d'éthique existe à l'Université de Conakry. Et les directives de SIOMS de 2016 sont également appliquées. Qu'est-ce que c'est que l'innovation pour la santé Il s'agit de l'introduction d'une nouveauté, la promotion d'une bonne pratique, la transformation majeure pour améliorer la couverture, l'accès, l'utilisation et la qualité des soins de santé dans la perspective d'un système de santé performant ou une justice sociale, c'est-à-dire l'équité. C'est là soutenant une politique et des pratiques de l'innovation impliquant des choix et orientations et engagements des parties prenantes, des démarches de modélisation, capacitation et mesures, c'est-à-dire le suivi et évaluation, la résistance de la recherche sur la mise en œuvre, c'est-à-dire que les innovations vont être construites à partir de la recherche sur la mise en œuvre avec des standards promus et internalisés pour la pérennisation. Le processus d'innovation pour la santé, les leçons ont été apprises de la santé préoccupant pour infléchir les tendances observées. Les innovations ont été introduites, surtout dans l'amélioration de la santé de la mère et de l'enfant. C'est le renforcement des capacités humaines et des techniques. C'est la recherche sur la mise en œuvre. C'est la santé de proximité avec l'apport des associations et des organisations confessionnelles. C'est l'engagement communautaire. On a également procédé à la formation des cadres en épidémiologie de terrain dans le cadre du programme FLTP, la formation en éthique de la recherche et des soins, le renforcement du système de laboratoire avec l'ONG APHL des États-Unis et, et sur le financement de la Banque mondiale avec la Bougie, le renforcement des capacités des, de l'Institut national de santé publique, du centre de recherche de Mafreya, de l'Institut de nutrition et de santé de l'enfant le développement de la santé communautaire avec une dimension importante des pipelines rurales. C'est l'apport inédit du numérique, c'est-à-dire 
le district sanitaire peut communiquer avec le niveau central de façon virtuelle. En fait, il s'agit de questionner la politique et les pratiques dans le sens d'amorcer l'innovation, c'est-à-dire les données sur les ménages et les cibles des interventions, les paquets, le paquet de services promotionnels de services intégrés, le paquet de préventif et de surveillance également des maladies infectieuses et le paquet curatif. En plus, les données sont analysées et utilisées pour la prise de décision et l'action. L'action de renforcement des capacités intensifiées et ayant produit des résultats probants dans le domaine de la prévention, de la prise en charge des problèmes de santé de la mère et de l'enfant. La surveillance épidémiologique interface homme animal et environnement avec implication des agents de santé communautaires et des relais. L'action de santé publique, notamment la communication sur les risques, le partage de l'information, les investigations, le suivi des contacts, la, euh, la prévention contre les infections et la gestion des déchets médicaux, la gestion du matériel biomédical. Ok, générer et exploiter les connaissances dans le cadre de la perspective des innovations, promouvoir l'engagement communautaire, les efforts de contrôle de, de, de la pandémie COVID-19, minimiser les risques par des limites acceptables, développer les mécanismes d'une bonne gouvernance pour la défragmentation du système de santé vers la couverture sanitaire universelle. Et la promotion de l'éthique des soins, l'éthique de la recherche et de la santé publique, décrit des critères éthiques les plus pertinents pour les études sur les défis humains dans le domaine des soins, de l'investigation des maladies infectieuses, l'action de santé publique. En conclusion, le vécu pendant l'épidémie d'Ebola a poussé à l'innovation pour anticiper sur les plans préventifs, la prévention, la surveillance des maladies à potentiel épidémique. L'innovation a éclairé les choix stratégiques pour la qualification et l'humanisation de l'action de santé publique. Les leçons apprises de l'implémentation des innovations orientent les politiques pour une meilleure vision. Les défis de l'innovation pour la santé sont d'ordre technique, humain et éthique. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Dr. Diallo. So we now um, have half an hour for questions and answers. And we can go to the on-air platform. So I encourage you in the on-air platform to enter your question. And I am going to ask Sassy if she can um, read out any questions that are there. Because um, in my version, I don't actually have any current questions, so maybe it's uploading, but I think you can see some sassy. Um, yeah, I can see a few questions. I'd just like to encourage everyone to add further questions. Um, the ones I can see are primarily ones I admit I have written myself. Um, just making sure I can get into the right space. It can be a little tricky, can't it, to manage two different spots. Um, yeah, so maybe not deliberately, not in order of speakers, just um, to get us going in a way. Um, but maybe just to ask you um, first, Pratap, if that's okay. Um, First of all, it's just it was really nice to see so many different voices in your. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, cool. I suddenly had an echo there. Yeah, great to see so many different voices in your um, presentation, which is really nice. Um, you have to teach us how you did that one at some point. Um, I was just interested that innovation. And I guess you're thinking specifically of local innovation being an area that's that's challenged. And I just wanted to counterbalance that with some other work that I'm involved with for health systems, where one of the comments is that there's a lot of innovations, maybe not necessarily local, um, that are often being brought into health systems, sometimes with unclear governance structures. So it can be challenging and that can be quite disruptive and challenging for health managers and frontline staff if these things are being introduced and shifted quite often. I just wondered if you could reflect a little bit on that in part of your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sassy. Um, 
Uh, yeah, firstly about the uh, uh, differences. I think it uh, uh, is good to be coincidentally in this session uh, called Accounting for the Many Voices. And uh, that is one message that we really wanted to get across that it's not just about uh, the public health practitioners, but there's um, the innovators themselves and uh, business schools and other actors who are supporting this entire um, innovation ecosystem. Um, so uh, to be more specific about this question about how um, we can get innovation and more innovation included in local health systems, um, uh, I think the answer is to go uh, look more broadly and what are we trying to do? Uh, yes, uh, different innovations at any specific time will help a certain problem, but to be really sustainable and taken up, uh, which we see one of the biggest challenge with, challenges with innovation is moving from a pilot to, uh, to growth and sustainability. I think it, the answer is to look um, holistically at how we want to engage with innovation in a health system. And uh, what are the vehicles that uh, promote innovation? And so um, in this particular program, we focus a lot on the entrepreneurial aspect of how we uh, support the actors with uh, entrepreneurial education uh, to be able to manage innovations. We need to understand not only who innovates, but what the enabling factors for that innovation are, both in early stage and, and to grow. So I think. Uh, there is no uh, easy answer to say uh, innovation should be structured in a certain way, but I think the health system needs to um, have a more uh, thoughtful engagement with innovation and all its aspects so that we can create that ena enabling environment. Thanks, Prata. Um, Hayley, do you want me to ask one more question that's a bit related to that? Um, and then maybe you could ask some of your questions and I can come back go and ask ahead. some more. Go ahead. I unfortunately can't see any questions. So if you could um, ask what you see there, that would be great. And I can come in then. Great. So um, you mentioned the importance of uh, taking innovations, interventions to scale press up. Uh, and Anna, a question that I had for you, um, I'm not sure if you saw it there in the chat, is that, um, you know, recognizing that one size doesn't fit all um, and the importance of microprocesses and local context and realities. Is there any way that one can think at scale about some of the potential interventions that are relevant relevant and feasible that pray, play proper attention to that recognition that one size really doesn't fit all? I think for me this is a recurring question, um, the scalability question. And I've really come to think about promoting certain practices, ethical practices that value uh, trust, reciprocity, um, accountability, respect, um, uh, that encourage the intellectual energy of people that are directly involved in something as practices that need to be taken up to scale. Um, so it's, it's practices and processes that need to be scaled up so that people can innovate and respond to local challenges and strengthen the health systems within which they are located. And strengthening the microsystem must contribute to strengthening the whole system if there is that culture of reciprocity and accountability uh, and adaptability. Um, and I don't think we have much experience in that, certainly not in our, uh, in the health system that I'm located in. Um, what we do have is, is hierarchical structures, centralized power, um, requiring compliance rather than commitment and innovation. Um, so I think that would be my, my, my response. I'm not sure what others um, would feel in relation to that. Um, it's not a quick fix. 
um, in my experience, every quick fix solution has been retrogressive rather than <laughs> progressive. Uh, it takes time uh, to build human capacity to, to respond to the context within which you find yourself. I wonder if we could bring David Musoka then into this um, conversation because I was really interested in the challenges that you identified with respect to community health worker practice now in the Ugandan health system. And I wonder, listening to Anna and this analysis of the microsystem and the sort of um, leadership and support required to kind of build up a, a particular kind of practice that enables um, you know, improvement in, in um, commitment, ethical practice and so forth. How would you reflect on that in terms of the challenges you identified and what might be some of your recommendations then for shifting this situation in the district where you worked in Uganda? David, have we I think we might have, have we lost David? I, I see his, ah, David. Thank you very much, regarding um, health practitioners, uh, Hayley. Uh, can you hear me, Hayley? I can now, we, we had you frozen for a minute, but go ahead, David. <laughs> So sorry about that. So uh, for me, I would say that um, one of the critical uh, interventions would really be a capacity building through training, because from our particular study, we realized that whereas the community workers had some information and knowledge on, uh, you know, ethical principles, they hadn't necessarily undergone any particular trainings to make them aware of how they should specifically, you know, handle patients and how they should do with the communities. And I think even for higher level health practitioners in, you know, if there's no formal training to raise, you know, many of these ethical issues, you would find that um, either they are not aware or they do, you know, whatever they do just by instinct because they know that, okay, something is actually uh, supposed to be done that way. So I think for me, capacity building through trainings that are specifically targeting ethical uh, concerns would really help the health practitioners uh, perform better and ensure that during the course of their work, that they really observe many of these uh, uh, principles. Haley, um, I'm wondering if maybe I can jump in because I, like to me, the reason, Go ahead. the reason why I was interested in doing um, the study that I did was just what we're talking about. It's like, what has to go in the background to make innovation happen, to make, um, you know, to support community workers with ethical decision-making, to, to make those micro adaptations in very specific environments. And, you know, when I was working in the field of mental health, it, it just struck me that we don't invest in that. We don't invest in people who know how, sometimes we invest in training, not always, and certainly not across contexts at scale, but we, we don't invest in the, the, the I'm gonna, I call it the implementation infrastructure, which is why I study these intermediaries um, that are kind of in the background. They're a bit of the engine. They have, um, there are people who have expertise more in change management, uh, implementation coaching support, how, you know, coaching and facilitation around uh, how to take the training and apply it and working with those community workers around, um, you know, applying that, those ethical frameworks and, and the challenges they encounter, doing some of those micro adaptations in a waiting room. Um, and, and so um, I'm really interested in trying to understand and unpack what's needed in that and how it can be applied to different circumstances. And I mean, obviously, um, the, the global context is critical, but the reason why I ended up studying three countries who were well-developed was because they had attempted to invest in this infrastructure and there's probably things we could learn about it as a global community. So I just wanted to kind of, it's almost like the, the stuff that I'm interested in is like that messy background behind these really interesting components that Pratap and uh, David and Alpha uh, were, were speaking about in their presentations. If I may add, um, to me, um, health systems need to have that kind of intermediary capacity that Heather is talking about built into their health systems. Uh, people who can go into microsystems and 
analyze a situation and coach and facilitate change to have that built within uh, the health system. Largely now it's dependent on outside facilitators and researchers, but a strong health system would have that capacity built within it. One of the things that was interesting that I didn't present in the presentation was this infrastructure, if you look, I, I did um, an analysis first of the nine countries that belong to this thing called the International Initiative for Mental Health Leadership. And actually the infrastructure varies depending on the country. So sometimes it's within the health system um, and that might be the right place for it. Sometimes it's, it's actually, it, you know, kind of in a very applied academic environment that has credibility with the health system and with the, with the, the folks working in it. Um, sometimes it's in an agency, sometimes it's an NGO. So I think um, what I found, at least in this analysis of nine countries, is, is that where it exists matters less than, what, than if it has credibility to do the work in the system. So that's that, you know, and from that innovation perspective, we can look broadly for where we might find that capacity. But what is true if you want to do it at scale is that those policymakers need the policy world needs to understand and accept it as part of the infrastructure. If they're not on board, it doesn't work. Um, and it remains kind of like those micro innovation. I would totally agree. Sorry, yeah. just briefly in there, because uh, this is what you're seeing in the innovation management education that we have started with the high level managers uh, so that they understand these different systems that need to work within the existing systems. And so uh, you're right completely, Heather, that um, it doesn't matter where it exists as long as it can work with the system. So it could be within an NGO. Uh, we talk about entrepreneurship so that we can allow existing players within the health system to take an entrepreneurial approach to serve for providing these services like quality improvement, audit and feedback and so on that you, uh, that you uh, saw as a missing gap. Um, and so uh, now translating that now from a higher level management to a bottom up approach would be is our big challenge. How do we take uh, this uh, approach and empower the community health workers, the clinical officers, uh, the nurses to start providing uh, services that are needed and that we know are needed. Thank you. I wonder if we can bring in Dr. Diallo into the conversation. Karina, are um, you there? I wonder if, if we could ask him um, on his reflections from the Ghanaian health system on this idea of building intermediary capacity within the health system and particularly with his focus also on um, epidemics. Um, I wondered particularly about um, frontline um, practitioners and, and sort of a focus on that, that ethics of practice as we saw in David's presentation. If Dr. Diallo has is aware of any efforts in Guinea to focus there. Bonjour, uh, Dr. Diallo. Les collègues sont en train de discuter un peu les conditions qui facilitent les, les innovations dans le système de santé. Ils étaient en train de surtout focuser sur les intermédiaires uh, uh, en disant que, bon, si, si vous avez présenté, par exemple, une, toute une série de de, de réformes, des innovations au niveau de répondre aux épidémies dans, dans votre pays. Et euh, les collègues étaient en train de, de, de discuter un, un petit peu quelles exactement sont les conditions qui facilitent euh, l'intervention des intermédiaires au niveau, euh, comment dit-on, frontline, I don't know how to translate that, um, au niveau de direct disons au niveau de, 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 de travailleurs, de, 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 des agents qui sont dans le système eux-mêmes. Euh, parce qu'on euh, était en train de discuter que souvent les, euh, les interventions dépendent fortement sur, euh, sur des agents externes. Et donc on était, euh, on était très curieux dans le cas de, de Guinée de savoir un peu plus sur Comment générer, comment générer une, 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 une motivation, une, une innovation au niveau du système euh, propre, au niveau des, des, des travailleurs de santé, etc. J'espère que j'ai bien traduit. J'espère je, je, que vous avez... Oui. Thank you, Karina. Dr. Diallo, did you, did you want to come in? Have we lost him? 
Je ne sais pas. Est-ce que, est que vous m'entendez? Oh, that was a lot of effort. Dr. Diallo is still there. Um, I'm just wondering if he maybe isn't in front of his computer. Goodness, um, much gratitude to <laughs> I think we might have lost him. <laughs> well, it would have been interesting to know in any case because it's such an interesting um, country because I'm an and he's so experienced that it seems that he yeah. he isn't isn't there. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I had a quick question, if that's okay, of, of some of the presenters because I find the idea of innovation quite interesting and whether we're really talking about innovations or whether, you know, what are the sort of thresholds and the moment at which something which, you know, which, which, you know, that expression of this is the way we do things around here turns to, okay, this is now we're going to do things differently. And there's kinds of lots of theories around, you know, how communities of practice change, how there's a paradigm shift in terms of um, doing things differently. And I just wondered, um, you know, to hear from, from, from Heather but as well, just around that that you know that moment of, of paradigmatic transition in terms of innovation and what you know what gets treated as an innovation and what how does it get disseminated then yeah any responses from anyone very interesting question uh, sure I can take a stab <laughs> um, uh, if I may, I'll keep it short. Uh, I think I would uh, uh, say two things. One is that there is no aha switch moment. I don't think um, uh, it's easy to say that suddenly it becomes an innovation that uh, you should put your effort into. I would take a human design uh, centered design lens and they talk about these three things that are important for these things to be, uh, for innovations to be successful. One is desirability that people need to want them. Uh, one is the feasibility that it can actually be done uh, and then there's a viability, and this can be repeatable and scalable. And these three things should be combined um, or ideally come together for something that's then we would put our effort into and say, okay, this is something that we should take forward. Uh, so there's no uh, one uh, moment, it's a lot of hard work with each idea. Uh, so uh, uh, that's all I have to say. Just relatedly, I'm really interested in the interplay between innovation and evidence. Um, because you know we're all talking about implementation of evidence and um, and considering carefully our capacity to do new things, and you know only to be assured that when we're going to make this massive effort to implement something, there's a certain level of evidence to support that that um, it would work across different contexts. So I think this idea of when. Like when does evidence enter uh, processes of innovation and uh, the interplay between the two and the co-construction of them is also really fascinating um, and of interest. And I think that the um, if you're talking about a system level, um, it depends of course on, on the system actors, but in my context, um, innovations are risky for uh, they're, they're, they're good to pilot, they're good to, you know, to, to try things out, but uh, for an investment, a large scale investment in implementation, it's, it's a risk. And so some of it's about framing um, what we're doing um, and whether, whether, the, whether innovation is sexy um, to the system or whether it actually would, would make uh, there be more risk aversion in terms of trying to do things differently. Um, but I would say that the goal alignment, the desire to do something differently that uh, Pratap mentioned is, is key in any implementation. Because often with the work that I do, the government has decided to do something and the system hasn't necessarily decided it's what they want to invest their limited time to do different things on. Um, so some of this implementation support is, is, is you have to back way up and just try and start to build uh, alliance around the need to do things differently and what needs to change and the motivation to make those changes. So, um, so you know, and, and I think the aha only comes when you can kind of see a collective of different uh, key stakeholders or actors who 
sometimes the light bulb goes on when you're doing that coaching and that facilitation where they, you can see the room shift and they decide they want to, they want to do it. Otherwise it's never going to be effective. So that's, that, that's very qualitative, but <laughs> that's my answer. That's really interesting. Yeah. I think that probably chimes also with what um, Anna was saying. So we, we need to wrap up because the session finishes at, at 2.15 UK time. So, I mean, I think really um, interesting um, common themes actually across around the sort of environments in which change happens, how to support change, the idea of intermediaries and frontline and practitioners. So I wondered if you could all just just briefly maybe reflect on what you've, you've learned in this conversation across and, and, and what your sort of final reflection might be from the session. So um, maybe we can start with, with David, just briefly, what have you learned from others and, and would, you, would you like a final wrap up comment, David? Thank you very much, uh, Haley. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah, so this has been very interesting. Oh, goodness. I think we might just have lost David, or is it just me? We've lost David. And it was quite pleasing to hear the work of others and I need for capacity building and strength. I think you have, can you hear me? Sorry, I think my connection is, is bad. So please go on ahead with the rest if you can't hear me. I think we might have to move on, David. It's very distorted, but we heard you said this very interesting around the conversation around capacity strengthening, and I think that was a really interesting element. Um, let's um, see if if um, Dr. Diallo might be back. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Would you have any um, final reflections, Dr. Diallo? Um, I know it's been difficult because the conversation's been in, in um, English, but um, you might have picked up something. It will be difficult for me to tell it in English, but I will try. Uh, in Guinea, we have two epidemic uh, contexts, Ebola, uh, between uh, uh, nine, uh, 24 and 26. After it, we have COVID. Between the two epidemic, we make many things. <clears throat> We implemented One Health, One Health, uh, and uh, we developed the capacity in laboratory with the help of uh, the World Bank and uh, who. Also, we developed many things about training. Also, uh, uh, we work uh, at the community health. And the surveillance, surveillance uh, between the three, the three level, the three, the three field environment, health, and uh, and uh, animals, uh, animals disease. I can't speak. I can't tell it in in French. I think. I think we, we were just wrapping up, but I, I get your point. You're talking about the sort of capacity strengthening right. and epidemic response. If you may, maybe we have Karina, but if you can just briefly, maybe in French, just a one sentence um, wrap up um, summary of, of, of your, your point. Karina can translate. Oui, Dr. Diallo, vous pouvez parler en français. C'est juste, juste pour avoir uh, quelques petits, uh, petits mots. Uh, à la fin de, de ce discours, à, à cette conférence. Si vous avez deux ou trois mots à dire, je peux les traduire. Dr. Diallo, did you want to come back? Oh, goodness. I think we might have lost him again. Okay. 
sorry about that. that. <laughs> I think it must be his his connection. Um, well, at least he, he made it. It was interesting to hear him, at least. Anna, did you want to just give any wrap-up reflections of common themes or final statement? Yes, what really struck me was uh, Sassy's opening comment saying that we've got a disparate set of presentations and we won't try and mold you all into one. But I mean, it's been quite amazing, the synchronicity and the synergies across the presentations and the ethics involved in the work, uh, which is basically a human-centered ethic to encourage um, intellectual in investment in the intellectual energy of people that are involved in the system um, at whatever level. Um, so that's really what's, what struck me. And that for me is important ethical principle. Thank you. That's, that's very nice. And then, um, um, Pratap, did you have a, a, anything to add? Uh, sure, thank you. I think I'll uh, echo what Anna says. Uh, I think uh, to, maybe to give it some more direction, I feel like we've um, uh, come from two different angles of top down and bottom up. There's a lot of um, uh, voices that uh, and actors uh, involved in delivering healthcare and supporting health systems, uh, but also the managers. And we uh, should try and uh, align forces to see if we can meet and broaden this approach. Indeed. And, and finally, um, Heather, any wrap up comments from you? When I was listening to the discussion, um, I was thinking about a puzzle and maybe that's because I've been doing some of those during COVID, but um, I feel like we had uh, puzzle pieces here and uh, as Pratap just mentioned, um, you know, there's an opportunity to start to put those pieces together that would do a better job of supporting um, better health for all. And so, I, so I, I do think actually this was really way more uh, interconnected than we had originally thought it would be through the discussion. And, and that's quite exciting. It, it provides lots of opportunity for further exploration and, and hopefully even collaboration from the different lenses in the future. Thank you, indeed. I, I think some very um, interesting themes there. And as Anna was saying, this kind of emphasis also on the sort of human ethics and the practical ethics of the everyday. And Sassy, so I want to give you the final word to bring us back to the, the, the ethics theme of the TWG as we wrap up. Well, I'm not sure that I need to, because I really think that that's been so nicely highlighted by all of you. Um, but, you know, Anna in particular, you, you mentioned that I said at the beginning, we're not going to attempt to pull things together. But I think you've all, we've all done a great job of doing that um, naturally. It's no one ever wants to leave a meeting like this with an, an action point of any form. But if any of you were inspired to write a paragraph that said that in any way, we'd be more than happy to try to get that out as as a key reflection point and perhaps as a reference back to this session to ask people to look at your and listen to your presentations because I think with a meeting like this it's inevitable that people are torn in lots of different directions might not necessarily have an opportunity to tune in unless they're given a little prompt to do so so very happy if anyone wanted to pull together a paragraph we could share it between us make sure we're happy about the theme um, that we, we see coming across could share that. But thank you so much to all of you, really uh, actually much more integrated and, and in some ways more exciting than I even imagined. So thank you so much. Indeed, thank you to the speaker. Thank you to Karina for, for translating for us and to um, Dr. Diallo particularly for joining despite um, the, the inability of, of us to accommodate the French completely. So thank you to everybody and also to the conference organizers. Okay, bye. <laughs> Thanks.